Great, so welcome everybody. I'm David Ezer, Vice President of Programs with Jewish Funders Network, and thanks so much for coming to today's program. Special briefing on security in a time of unrest. Uh, after the events of a couple of weeks ago, we wanted to be sure that we had an opportunity for everybody to, in the wisdom of our the, the, the resources that we have in our network, and to that end, I am happy to begin. I'm gonna turn this to Andres, are you, sorry, are you prepared? Okay, we'll turn this to Andres Fikoyne, CEO of Jewish Funders Network, and thanks so much. Thank you, and uh, pleasure to be here uh, with all of you. I would love for the topic to be more cheerful, but it is really good to be, to be able to discuss this with such a distinguished panel. Mm -hmm. um, as everybody in America and in the world, I'm shocked uh, by what happened uh, a few days ago in the capital, and by the and by the fear, and that that this is, you know, going to replicate, and very afraid of the repercussions this could have in the Jewish community, as we know from our sad uh, history in, in these cases. Whenever there is uh, upheaval and and problems in the general society, sooner or later it, it ends up <coughs> impacting the Jewish community. So this is what we're here to discuss. Um, I want to give the floor to the moderator of this session, uh, Carly Meisel, Global CEO for Philanthropy of the Kirsch uh, Philanthropist. And uh, Carly also is probably one of the most knowledgeable Jeff and members in terms of security and uh, has been uh, a mentor for many of us in this, in this topic and an engine behind um, the adoption of, uh, of more interest in, in this issue by the, by the philanthropic community as a whole. So it's really great to have you, Carly. Uh, <clears throat> for, for those of you that follow the uh, activities of the Kirsch Foundation. Uh, Carly is also doing something called Lockdown University, where she interviews amazing speakers. So if anybody has the chance and hasn't seen it yet, I invite you all to, for, to, to look at it. It's really a great thing. So with that, I'll give the floor to you, Carly. Thank you, Andres. I think that's the most complimentary you've ever been about me and no doubt ever will be. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm taking that one with me. Um, so first of all, I'm going to introduce our very esteemed panelists. Um, they all have incredibly lengthy bios, so I hope they will forgive me for shortening those bios or we would be here for the entire hour. Um, it's no reflection on their experience. So um, first up is Stephen Hughes, who's the Chief Security Officer at Elliott Management Corporation. Um, prior to joining Elliot, Mr. Hughes spent a 25-year career with the U.S. Secret Service. Um, he began that career in 1989 in the New York field office and later went on to serve with the Joint Terrorism Task Force. He also served on the protect, DT, protect details for uh, President Clinton and President Bush um, and has a lot of firsthand experience both in New York and in, the, uh, in Washington, D.C. at several <coughs> levels both at a supervisor level and of course with several presidential inaugurations. Up next is Richard Prem, who is the Director of Security Operations at CSS. Prior to joining CSS, Richard worked in various capacities in the United Nations, including most recently as a counterterrorism advisor to the Security Council. He also served as the New York Director for International Affairs at the ADL. And before moving to the US, Richard led training for the Jewish Community <coughs> Security Organization in the Netherlands and completed his military service as a paratrooper in the IDF. Um, Brad Orsini is the next of our experts up. And Brad is the Senior National Security Advisor for SCN, for SCAN. Um, Brad has a extensive career for, um, in, the, in the FBI um, and Brad joins us today from Pittsburgh, where he was the um, head of security for the Greater Pittsburgh um, Jewish community from 2017 to 2020. So for those of you concentrating on your dates, Brad obviously brings some unique experience of an incredibly challenging and tragic time um, in Pittsburgh. And um, prior to joining the FBI, 
Uh, Brad was an active duty officer in the United States Marine Corps, attaining the rank of captain. And last, but by no means least, um, Mitch Silver, who is the <coughs> executive director of the Community Security Initiative, um, which is a joint uh, project of UJA and JCRC of New York, um, which is a $4 million initiative to help secure the Jewish institutions of New York. Um, Mitch has a background as the director of intelligence analyst for New York City Police Department. And he also has spent the last several years engaging with the Jewish communities in Europe um, and helping can think about how they secure themselves. So we've got a lot to discuss in an hour. And I actually wanted to start by, by setting the scene and providing some context before we focus on the Jewish community. So Steve, I'm gonna turn to you and ask you to comment initially on, on the 6th of January and what, what you took away from those events as a secret service um, and security expert. Thanks Carly, and thanks for having me today. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I was sickened to see what I saw on the 6th of January, having spent so much time on Capitol Hill. And when I was in Washington, the division that I ran was in charge of the inauguration for 2013 and 2009, and also for State of the Union or any joint session of Congress where the president would speak. So those were all national special security events, which is the highest level. Tomorrow's inauguration will be an NSSE as well. And with that high level of security, you bring together 60, 70 plus agencies to get and coordinate a security plan. What surprised me was that maybe that the January 6th wasn't treated to that level. The intelligence was there. I mean, open source, you could see that it was a bad day. The president calling for a wild day. And so uh, I was a little surprised that maybe they are on their heels uh, without as much security as I would have expected for an event like that, that was surely going to lead to a mass amount of people approaching the Capitol. Um, if you notice the fencing you see on TV, that's something the anti-scale fencing that we started incorporating in the mid 2000s to our national special security events. Didn't see any of that really up. I just saw a bike rack up for uh, what happened on January 6th. So uh, it's all about being ready, being prepared, be, uh, having a plan in place and having the integration of the different agencies coordinated to respond to something that would happen. And uh, I don't wanna say they treated the January 6th as business as usual day, but they certainly didn't bring it to the level that it needed to be. Thank you. And then, Brad, I, I'd like to turn to you to, with your FBI hat on. Um, reflecting on your experience, what do you see the next few weeks looking like and what types of steps would the FBI be taking? So, Thank you, Carly. Uh, yesterday, we actually, myself and a few members from Secure Community Network, were actually on a threat briefing conducted by the FBI yesterday for the Jewish community. And although we're not seeing any specific threats targeting in our community, I think it's important as we conducted a webinar last week that uh, exact, exactly what Steve said, it's all about preparedness. The only thing our community truly has under our control is how well we prepare our community and, and the steps we can take. So we've provided guidance for civil unrest uh, for our communal organizations, things they can do now. But the most important thing each community could do is really listen to that local threat in the community. And that needs to be the, the deciding point on whether or not they should open, they should close, uh, shutter their facilities early, depending on that local intelligence. Now that we have threats to all 50 state capitals throughout the day, this threat is not gonna go away on Thursday. And especially for our community, we need to think long-term. We need to think you know, all the way to March 4th, which was the original inauguration day in our country 150 years ago, and what white supremacists use now as the true and only inauguration day, right? So although there's no specific threats to our community, we need to have all our organizations rely on that, that nexus with local state and federal law enforcement in their community to understand the true threat. We can provide national guidance. We are seeing threats to our community on a daily basis. Our, 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 uh, our Intel Center takes in threats routinely and then pushes back that information out so we can guide. We've had threats directed specifically at Jewish leaders in the United States, suspicious vehicles, people taking pictures of our facilities. We need to be hyper-focused on security right now to secure the Jewish community. 
Thank you. So, Mitch, um, I wanted to talk a little bit before we kind of do a deep dive on what the community can do. Um, I want to understand what resources we already have. And I know that CSI and CSS now share an intelligence officer who's based at the ADL. Um, and I know that this is a, a relatively new position, but a position that in a short amount of time has already shown it, its value. So perhaps you can explain a little bit more to the group about that intel officer and how intelligence is going to help get the Jewish community through the next couple of months um, and beyond. Sure. Thanks so much for having me on, Carly. You know, I think we heard a lot about hardening the target and making sure that our defenses uh, are as strong as they can be. But I think what really complements that effort is having anticipatory intelligence, knowing what's coming at you, knowing where it's coming from, and being prepared for that. So as part of thinking about that, a real priority for me at CSI was adding an intelligence analyst to our team, one that we share with CSS. And really the purpose of that individual is to be in the deep and dark corners of the deep web and the dark web, to be on private telegram channels, to be on parlor, to be on my militia, all of really the places of the internet um, where these individuals who are plotting and scheming uh, to take uh, actions that we want to know about in advance. I think when we think about this, you know, we say, listen, you know, if we had anticipatory intelligence, could we have identified a Robert Bowers, you know, as he was posting things on a gab before he mobilized the action in Pittsburgh? Could we have identified a John Ernst in Southern California before he attacked the Chabad in Poway? That's the way we did it at the NYPD uh, Intelligence Division. So we're trying to take some of those lessons, um, put them into place at CSI. And by the way, this isn't just a New York effort. Um, we share intelligence with other federations who also have intelligence analysts, like in Los Angeles, in Cleveland, and also more importantly, you know, they're at SCAN, at SCN, they also have a team of intelligence analysts that Brad referenced. So there's a constant dialogue among these different intelligence analysts sharing what they're seeing, because you know what? No one analyst is going to see it all. And let's just let's just go a little deeper on that. So anyone who's been watching the news in the last 10 days or so is obviously familiar with the four around Twitter, Facebook, etc. But they'll also be hearing new names that perhaps your mainstream public wouldn't be familiar with, be that Parler or you've just touched on Gab. Um, give everybody a, a kind of two minute, you know, briefing on, on what a lot of these different um, platforms can do. And then perhaps from a cyber perspective, you know, what, what you are, are taking into consideration. Sure, you know, you can think of the internet as having two parts, one being the surface web, what's readily, readily available on Facebook, on Twitter. And you know, that's sort of easier to identify because it's sort of out in the open. Then you can imagine conversations that are having in private, in a room where only the people who have the specific invitation are participating in. And some of these different other platforms, Telegram, 4chan, 8chan, Gab, these are places that people particularly go for so they can have private, encrypted, end-to-end -end conversations that they hope nobody else can identify. And right now, frankly, what we're seeing is a great migration. Now that some of these platforms, let's say like a parlor, that were a very permissive um, platform that didn't even restrict as much as a Facebook or a Twitter might have, they've been shut down. So suddenly many of these people who we've been watching sort of out in the open in parlor, they're moving to even harder to identify places. So there is a challenge for all of the analysts out there, for all of the platforms to follow these people as they migrate to even tougher places to monitor them. But that's really where the effort is right now. So Richard, I'd like to look to bring you in and understand how um, the, the intelligence capabilities that Mitch has just touched on um, will now have an effect on the CSS operation over the next couple of months and what this means for volunteer security. Thank you, Carly, for the question. And thank you for having me here uh, today. Um, I think one of the key things that the CSS does is training volunteers to be the eyes and ears in front of the synagogue. So if you have SCAN and CSI who have this intelligence capacity, we train people to, to identify and report suspicious activities taking place in front of their synagogues. And there have been several examples over the last few months where one of our teams 
saw someone coming to a synagogue and take pictures. And we were able to, to record either the license plate or to get a des description of the person doing that. And we were able to share that with, with Mitch's team, with Brad's team, in order to make sure that other synagogues around the country are aware that this is taking place and to allow it to sort of fit in the overall analysis of our, of our threat environment. So that is sort of what we are trying to feed into the intelligence analysis and also the other way around. We have teams across the country that see things and sometimes ask us, um, what does this mean? We had some activity on our, uh, the Facebook page of our synagogue, some weird accounts were liking this or they were, uh, 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 we see some other weird activity. What does it mean? We now have the ability through our partnership with SCAN, with CSI to go to them and say, listen, this is what has been happening at this synagogue. Can your analysts look into it? And in several occasions, that kind of partnership allowed us to, uh, to identify and respond. And in most cases, luckily, uh, uh, you know, um, make sure that that wasn't a threat to our community. So Brad, I, I wanna look at the national picture um, first. So, you know, I, I come from the UK and a national picture in the UK is somewhere you can drive in 24 hours if you put your foot down. A national picture in the US means something very different. And, you know, at the moment we are seeing the FBI briefings, you know, on threats across 50 states, you know, just, just help our audience understand what it means when you say you're looking at national preparation. So I think what's really important to understand is we have over 50 Jewish communal security professionals across the country, kind of facilitating security needs for our Jewish communities. The issue that we really have now is how do we blanket the entire country? We have many rural areas, suburban areas, many pockets of our country that do not have Jewish communal professionals. And so right now it's really important to link up all our communities to make sure in Dothan, Alabama, when they get a threat, how do we react to that? And how do we give them the resources to build a resilient community? And so you heard Mitch talk about the importance of, of this intelligence gathering. And we talked at the beginning about target hardening. And really what we need to look for as our entire Jewish community is that holistic security platform from assessment of our entire community to understand the gaps and vulnerabilities to all, you know, 12 to 15,000 facilities across the country, and then develop a training program and drill program. And then that threat mitigation, how do we collect this information and share that information and then make sure it gets the right law enforcement partners. We are seeing threats come in from all over the country at this point and different suspicious activities. So really what we do at the <clears throat> national level in our intelligence center, and we just brought another intelligence analyst in as we can continue to build our staff to really identify trends, to see where we can push resources to if we have to help mitigate a threat. But awareness is the number one thing we could do for our community. We could no longer ignore any sign of hate any suspicious activity, anything that our community, quite honestly, I've been working in Jewish communal security for the last four years. And when I began, and now it's completely different. I think our community is more uh, prone to report. Four years ago, they probably let things go. Now we can't afford to do that. So I encourage any member in any community to look for those resources. We convene a weekly meeting every Thursday with all Jewish communal uh, resources across North America and to include our partners in Canada where we go through trends, we see what's happening, and then we try to deploy best practices in the community really to try to build that conscious culture of security in any Jewish community. But the concern we do have is in those more rural areas, those suburban areas where our resources aren't as heavy, where we don't have that, that community uh, security program that we have in a lot of our cities. So we need to encourage to continue. We, we are opening up more security resources and communities. We are hiring community security directors right now, currently for three more federations and communities across the country. So our platform is actually increasing over the last year. And it's really important to identify these threats and report them up. Uh, so we can do that trend analysis and really uh, have link analysis so we can, as Mitch said, if there's a, the ability to 
proactively stop an attack, that is great. But at the same time, we need to build a resilient community. And quite honestly, we need to get our community to lock that front door as well. So all these things in that holistic security program we need to do, and, and we are there to, to kind of help any community across North America. Thank you, Brad. So Mitch, I, I'm going to use New York as an example, um, not for any reason than you're on the call. Um, so um, Brad mentioned one of your favorite words earlier, which is assessment. And then he mentioned one of my favorite sentences, which is lock the door. So, um, you know, I know that a lot of what, um, what you and your team are doing at the moment is looking to, to work with communities and to help them think about their security, think about their assessments, and also look to explore federal funding and, and dollars that are available for that. So just talk us through a little bit of that program. Sure. Well, as many of you may know that in the United States, one of the best ways for institutions to harden themselves as a target is to access federal grants from a program that comes from the Department of Homeland Security, the, the nonprofit uh, you know, grant program. Uh, fortunately, this year, the amount of money available in 2021 has been doubled from 90 million to 180 million, which is fantastic news, great effort by JFNA and other institutions, uh, you know, lobbying Congress to increase that given the threat situation we have around the country. In order to, to receive a grant, an institution has to conduct a very detailed um, physical security assessment, looking at the doors and the windows and the cameras and the street and the environment and only when they've completed that physical security um, assessment, which is really done by someone walking around with a clipboard, but very sophisticated in terms of their understanding of what the needs are for that assessment, that assessment then goes into a grant application. So recently we found out, as I mentioned, the amount of funds have been doubled. We don't know exactly when these grant applications are due, although historically it's usually towards the end of the first quarter, so end of March, early April. And what are we doing in New York? We are trying to hustle to get as many assessments done to help as many institutions as possible to be able to take advantage of this program. And we're trying to figure out ways to increase our throughput ability. How can we do more institutions in this short period of time? Hiring additional staff, looking at technological solutions. Uh, we really wanna make sure that we maximize the opportunity to win funds for our institutions. Carly, may I follow up? Because I think Mitch really brings a good point that I'd like to just spend one more minute talking about this grant, please. Since you complimented Mitch, absolutely. <laughs> so this is probably one of the important, most important things our organizations can do right now is to file for that grant. As Mitch said, that grant has doubled since last year. And really, traditionally, that grant has been $20 million a year for several, several years. Last year it was $90 million. This year it's $180 million. It is never, there's never been a more important time for every one of our organizations to file for those grants. We've been convening weekly webinars to give advice um, uh, to our synagogues and all our communal organizations across the country. I think last week we had a thousand folks on our webinar. We're doing another one this Thursday. We're going to walk through that assessment. Really important because also last year, total in, in fiscal year 2020, the, the amount of grants that were pushed through the entire system only were $160 million. And what does that mean? They had $90 million to give and they, they had $160 million. This year we have $180 million. We can't afford not to apply for that grant because if we don't exceed that $180 million, then we're going to lose that funding for next year. Very important. We actually are also going to send out a self-assessment template that is NSGP friendly where it actually ties in the authorized authorized equipment list and it is a very foolproof way to really do a number of assessments across the community because as mitch said it's a challenge for us in most jewish communal organizations wait till the bitter end we need to start that process now we need to get on those webinars we need to do those assessments and we'll have the tools for the community to do that but I can't agree with Mitch more how important this process is. Thanks, Carly, for giving me a little extra time there. Thank you. I hope you guys don't agree for the rest of the evening or it's gonna be very dull. 
Um, so Steve, you um, as a CSS board member are starting to put together a, a security council of advisors. So that's particularly important both to bring in the expertise of you know, people like yourself and Brad who come from the law enforcement space, but it's also helpful to understand for the non-Jewish world, why Jewish security and why the Jewish community are particularly sensitive about certain threats and why, as Andrea said at the beginning, unfortunately, from our point of view, you know, what starts with anybody else often ends with the Jews. So how are you going about building that and, and in making the case to law enforcement across the country about the threats to the Jewish community? So the, the Security Advisory Council for CSS, it was Don Aviv and I co-chairing, we're getting some tr experience that uh, is unbelievable from CIA, FBI, private sector. These are all a great advisory council. And we're going to look at CSS and the training. We're also going to look at policies and try to give some good advice on where we should go, because I think training is going to be key moving forward with CSS and really with Evan and Richard, it's really moving to the next level. So I think our expertise will come in, will come in handy for that. Um, as far as the intelligence, like, I don't know, and Mitch would probably talk better about this than I could, but I have to Google all these different groups. I've never seen so many groups coming out. The three percenters, the Oath Keepers, the Boogaloos. I mean, it's like, have you ever seen a time where there's been more groups so out in the open and so wearing their symbols in public uh, it's really, it's unbelievable. But this whole far right, this white supremacist uh, sort of acceptance right now, or there's at least they've been allowed some room to breathe. It's really impacting everyone and certainly the Jewish community. And I think with CSS, with the volunteers, it's as CSS says, it's building this culture of responsibility. And with that culture of responsibility, the more people that we can get to be volunteers and to be the eyes and ears on the ground, I think the more successful will be in prevention. And obviously prevention is what I've spent most of my time on and there's response and recovery. It's also part of that, but I think the more people we have engaged in this culture of responsibility and having a group to understand it's everyone's responsibility, I think it's only going to add to the success. Carly, if I could quickly uh, jump on that. You can, and I'm going to add one thing for you to take into consideration, Richard, because I was coming to you next. Um, without giving away any trade secrets, um, there was a good example a few weeks ago of, you know, how you take in intelligence that, um, that Stephen has mentioned in one of these organizations and how that process works along to like a volunteer seeing something on the streets. So maybe you can tell us, you know, that, that process and obviously add whatever you're going to add to Steve's point. Sure, uh, absolutely. But well, first of all, it is really helpful to us as an organization to have someone of the, the caliber and background as, as Steven to, to look at our training and to advise us as we uh, you know, develop responses for, for the threats that we face. But I think one of the things that we do as, as an organization that trains volunteers is that there's two things that we bring to the table. One is that when you're a volunteer protecting your own community, you have different stakes than if you're hired security or uh, law enforcement that spends time in the weekends uh, guarding the institution or just going on patrol. It's your family, it's your friends, so, you know, it is really on you to make sure that nothing happens that put them at risk. And the other thing is that only by being a member of that community are you really, really able to know what belongs and what doesn't belong. And there have been a number of examples in the last few months that sort of highlighted that, that importance. For example, um, this is an, an example from Germany where during, in Hamburg during Sukkot, there was uh, an individual who severely injured a Jewish student uh, coming to the synagogue for Sukkot. And that person arrived with a taxi on the corner of the street wearing a military fatigue pants and, and clearly not looking like someone that would come to services. And in Germany, at every synagogue, they right now have a police container standing there because of rising anti-Semitism and the German government feeling responsible to do something about it. So this person came out of, of his, the taxi, walked right past the police container, and the police did not see it as anything suspicious and walked towards the entrance of the synagogue. The volunteer security uh, guard that was standing there immediately recognized that this person is not the regular visitor. He didn't recognize him. He, he knew that the clothing that the person was wearing did not resemble anything that someone would wear to, to a sukkah. And he started to move congregants away. Unfortunately, one student arrived at that very moment and was severely injured uh, in an attack by this individual before the police came back and, and neutralized the, the attacker. So having that ability to A, recognize what belongs and what doesn't belong, 
B, being trained in basic security routines on how to respond when a threat actually uh, materializes. And, and of course, having the support from people like, like Steve to, to, to develop the training, I think is very, is very useful. But the majority of our work and our real, real focus is not to respond when an attack is actually taking place, but to prevent an attack from taking place in the first uh, place. And in most attacks on Jewish targets, unfortunately, um, there have been some pre-attack planning that took place, some surveillance, some information gathering. And that is really the moment where, where we can make a difference. Whether it's Jersey City or whether it's Pittsburgh or whether it's attacks that have taken place around the world, some level of preparation takes place. And our teams, our volunteers uh, are very well positioned to recognize when something's taking place in front of the synagogue that, that doesn't belong. And we've, just to, to, to your point, only a few weeks ago in, in the greater New York area um, um, and in Connecticut, we had two incidents where someone came uh, uh, drove around the, one of the synagogues, started making pictures, behaved very, very suspiciously. And we were able to, to record that, uh, report it with law enforcement, report it uh, to our, our partners at uh, CSI and SCAN, and made sure that the whole community is made aware that this individual or these individuals are conducting that activity. And, and hopefully that will help prevent uh, those individuals, if they did have harmful intent from ever executing their attack. So it is really that uh, infrastructure of being the eyes and ears on the ground through our volunteers, but having the partnerships in place with SCAN, with CSI, but also with law enforcement. And that is the other thing that we're really pushing our volunteers to do. We don't want them to be working uh, in the moment that something bad happens. We want them to be working when there's what we call good weather to build those partnerships with local law enforcement, to build the partnerships with organizations like SCAN and CSI to make sure when something does happen, we immediately have the, the information pipeline in place to respond to it. Thank you. So um, if anyone has any questions, by the way, because um, Andreas tells me you're all uh, sending them to him directly. So um, you can post them in the in the chat on the bottom and I will uh, I will will weave them in. Um, Mitch, I wanted to go go to you and uh, see if you could give a, a particular recent example of, of what I was talking about with the intel and how it manifests on the ground. Sure. You know, I, I think Stephen made a good point. We're all faced with so many new groups that we've never heard of before. And, you know, in fact, in Westchester, we had a situation where there were some stickers being put up by a group called Patriot Front. And our regional security manager who handles the Bronx and Westchester reported that into the rest of our team and then immediately triggered our intelligence analysts to go to work. And our intel analysts is based at the Anti-Defamation League in their center on extremism, where they've got expertise on all of these different groups that have been tracking this for a long time. So suddenly we got very smart on the Patriot front. They're a white ethno-nationalist extremist group. They believe that there's white genocide going on uh, and they are anti-Semitic. They believe that Jews are enabling the browning of America. And though they haven't committed violence yet, they've been arrested around the country. And in fact, they've got a leader uh, up in upstate New York. So we put that report out. We shared it with CSS. We shared it with S SCN. We shared it with law enforcement partners, FBI, NYPD, Manhattan DA's office. Then lo and behold, there were some more stickering campaigns in Westchester. And in conversation with law enforcement, they said, listen, you know, the stickering sounds benign. But actually what this is, is many of these groups send the stickers to their followers and as a test to see if they actually will carry out an act on their behalf, have them put those stickers up. And if they carry out that act, well, they know that's a test. They're at least willing to do some type of low risk activity you know, for the group. Lo and behold, more of those stickers have appeared all over Westchester. And just before jumping on the call here, our analyst wrote up a, a special report Patriot Front in Westchester, and we are distributing it to police departments in Westchester so they can look at their CCTV cameras to see when someone is putting up a sticker there, maybe they can identify the individuals and we can start to figure out what is behind this campaign in Westchester and is there more to be concerned about. Brad, um, Michael Masters of SCN and I have a, have a phrase that we, we like to bring back and forth between each other. And, and I obviously stole it from the Americans and, and we've extended it, which is, you know, that I always say that the, the Jewish community in America needs to learn from Europe and it needs to get to the point where the community is used to, if you see something, say something. And as Michael Masters likes to add, do something. 
So, you know, we, we need an education campaign and an understanding of, amongst the community about reporting, about, you know, what is anti-Semitism. If you're at synagogue in London, every person who walks in the front door tells you about a suspicious car that they weren't expecting to see there. Now you can tell them, you know, it's the warden's car and they left it there two days ago on purpose, but everyone has told you about that car. How do you think we get the, the community in America to take one step towards proactive awareness and being being more conscious of their surroundings? So I think it starts at the, at the ground level. If I use Mitch's example of the Patriot Front, first and foremost, when we see Patriot Front, Identity Europa, Ku Klux Klan, Proud Boys, any number of one of these groups, we need to identify that as a threat to our community and then push that out because a vast amount of our community, as we said at the very beginning, don't even know who these groups are. So if they see a Patriot Front flyer across the street from their synagogue, they may have no idea what that actually means. So one, we need to do a better job communally of identifying these groups, making sure our community knows who these groups are. So when they see that sign of hate or they see that flyering campaign, Patriot Front has been doing this for the last four years, flyering and stickering campaigns across the country. We need to make our community hyper aware of that so they don't dismiss it and report it, right? My sign off for years has, has been exactly what you said see something, say something, do something. Take that extra step to report it. It's very important that even though most of those items and those stickering and those flyering campaigns may be protected First Amendment rights speech here in the United States, it doesn't mean we should not report it as a community. The FBI will tell you in threat briefing after threat briefing or uh, hate crime indicator briefings that it's a jigsaw, right? jigsaw puzzle. They need all the pieces in order to assess that true threat in the community. So we really need to be aware in our community. We do so much just basic situational awareness training for our community, not just our countering act of threat, but just to wake our community up, to teach them those signs of hate, teach them those groups that are out there and the importance of reporting. We can give you probably 20 examples on why reporting makes a difference. And when you get that actionable item of intelligence to provide that to law enforcement, help facilitate a law enforcement response, be good partners with them and arrest that perpetrator, identify that perpetrator before something bad even happens. That's how it's truly gonna work in our community. And you, any community needs to do that, it is our community. Carly, if I could just jump in real quick for a success story. 1981, President Reagan assassination attempt, John Hinckley, he was able to get himself in with the traveling press pool. So the Secret Service then assigned an agent to that pool. But from that day forward, anytime someone that wasn't part of that press pool, that press would notify the Secret Service, hey, this guy's not with us. So we wouldn't have anyone infiltrate that traveling press pool. And I can't tell you how many times they came up to me and would tell me this guy's not with us. And that just awareness is, is so important. And then reporting it to someone that can do something. Uh, just a a great addition to what, what Brad was saying about how, how that works and it really can be successful. And that is really, sorry, Carly, to, to jump uh, on this as well. Um, that is really, I think, one of the, the added values of, of the CSS because you don't have to be a law enforcement or a professional to be able to contribute to our collective security. As you mentioned, the example in, in London where people would arrive and tell you this does not belong and you as someone involved in security would be able to, you know, to either uh, uh, throw it out or investigate. We are developing programs to enable anyone who wants to do more for their community security to, to get involved because you don't need to be a, a ninja or a, a Krav Maga expert in order to know um, or to report something suspicious. And in fact, just by being a member of a community, you're better equipped to recognize what belongs and what doesn't belong than most. And we're trying to develop more and more programs to get more and more people in our community involved and start to see security as something that they have ownership over and that they have a responsibility to work. So Mitch, um, every, every organization on this call has a C, has an S, there's an N in the title. You know, we got a lot of acronyms going on here. And I suspect that for a lot of funders on the call, you know, the big concern, and it's always a concern at the Kirsch Foundation is, you know, how is everybody working together? And, and you know, is there, is there gaps being plugged? And are you really, um, 
the, is the total greater than the sum of the parts. So, you know, I know that actually there's been a lot of progress in this space in the last few months. So perhaps you can touch on how you work both with CSS and with SCAN and any other organization that's not on the call. Sure, you know, you're right. And, and it's not that different from the situation when you're in law enforcement and you've got a lot of other three letter agencies and they all have to figure out how to uh, play well in the sandbox. And I think we've had a, a similar situation here where all of our organizations have gotten to know each other a little bit better. There's been a little bit of jockeying and elbowing, um, but I'd say right now in January of 2021, it's the best the situation has been. And what I mean, and I'll give you the perspective from the CSI um, view, which is sort of one security group for one you know, geographic area, Greater New York, um, you know, we have a partnership with CSS that's here on the ground in Greater New York. Um, you know, Richard and Evan, their team are, you know, sort of serving those extra eyes and ears, extra physical protective layer at institutions. And there's regular conversations between um, executive staff as well as my team and their team, you know, sort of on the streets um, when an incident happens. We respond simultaneously. Richard has responded with our team in certain geographies. So that's sort of at the hyper local. At the national, and there's really, you know, I'm, I'm just going not in any particular order here, it's CSI and SCN. Um, you know, we, we found a good modus operandi. You know, SCN realizes that in New York, we've got boots on the ground. We're gonna have the expertise uh, here in the city. But on the other hand, SCN is looking at the national picture. They may be picking up things uh, across the country that we can't see. They're setting national standards. They are, you know, setting best practices. And there's a very robust interaction um, with our team and SCN team, as well as the intelligence sharing. Um, and in terms of groups that aren't on the call, I mentioned the Anti-Defamation League and their center on extremism, where they have about 18, 20 people who are essentially functioning as, an, as a deep web, dark web intelligence collection entity. They're looking at the national picture. We embedded our analysts there really for one purpose, to benefit by everything that they're looking for and to be able to pull out the New York thread. You know, it may be something happening across the country, but there's a New York thread to it. So at least from my perspective, I think things are, are in a good place. There's room for improvement. We also talk bilaterally with other cities. We talk with Los Angeles. We talk with Cleveland and Cincinnati and Ohio, who have got old programs that predate ours. We talk with our neighbors in New Jersey, because we know that bad guys aren't going to respect the Hudson River or state borders. Um, so why should we? So I think, you know, it, it's a partnership on multiple different levels, but at least from where I sit, I think it's the best it's been to date. Thank you, Mitch. So Richard, what does it take to bring CSS to a new city or town? You know, Brad has touched on the fact that they're looking to bring security directors into three new places. Um, and, you know, that, that actually across America, you know, we need to be stepping up our, our Jewish security engagement. So just talk me through what, what that means for CSS. Okay, so um, first of all, like CSS is a volunteer driven organization. So although we have professional staff and we develop training and we give guidance and we do analysis, um, the, the, the core of our work are the boots on the ground of, of volunteers that are stepping up and going through our training to be able to protect their community. However, we, we recognize each time an incident uh, happens, unfortunately, we get a lot of interest from uh, uh, synagogues who want to you know, do more about their security and, and find CSS and think that we are able to, to help them. But then when they find out that they will need to have a team of volunteers, they will need to go through training, it becomes quite a daunting uh, uh, um, a commitment to them. And, and unfortunately, in many cases, that means that we're not able to continue. So one thing that we are are in the process of finalizing is a new program called entry point and entry point is really uh, uh, an introductory course into css anyone can take it young old whatever gender anyone can participate it will be one two hours delivered virtually or in person that raises situational awareness and help people understand how they can contribute to their community security uh, it helps them understand what a suspicious activity and why it is important but also something that brad mentioned about how important it is to keep the door closed and by getting that people involved with 
that changed mindset, something that, I mean, I grew up in Europe and I always believed that the United States, everything was always better in terms of, of Jewish life. And, and unfortunately, now that I'm living in the United States and realizing that it comes to security, unfortunately, Europe is a little bit further ahead than the United States, within the Jewish community at least. And, and where in Europe, it's sort of a, a culture where everyone at a certain age will participate in their community security. That's not the case here. And we hope that with this new program, if there is a region where we don't have a strong presence yet, uh, by inviting CSS to come train your congregation about basic security routines and situational awareness, you get a pool of people that are willing to uh, come to the next level and go to what, what we call sort of more of our flagship or more advanced training that will result in having a standalone team of people uh, alternating shifts on a weekly basis to be able to really have that additional layer of volunteer security at their synagogue. So we will need some professional oversight. We will need to bring in trainers. We will need to get that um, uh, uh, operation off the ground in a new region. But ultimately, our volunteer regions are very much self-sustaining. We we'll train volunteers to be trainers within the region. We train volunteers to be team leaders, team managers, regional managers within the region. And although they're going to be part of a national network of uh, groups uh, like theirs, uh, we basically enable them to uh, operate uh, on their own with, us, uh, with guidance from us, but ultimately self-sustaining. Carly, may I just add one, one portion on training? Because I do think it's so important, just dovetailing on what Richard so said. I'm going to give you about a minute. So uh, That's all I need. I, I can't more. underscore, we talked a lot about the NSG program, a lot about the uh, importance of communicating and reporting those threats. Training is the number one thing we can do under our control for our community. Since COVID, we've developed different ways, just like a lot of organizations, to do training across the country. We probably trained a little over 20,000 people in calendar year 2020 on situational awareness, countering active threats, stop the bleed in every form we can. We, we did a training last week for synagogues across the country, and we're doing these in the worst pandemic our nation has ever seen. So we developed ways to do this virtually. Now is the time to take advantage of that. We have not refused training to any one organization. We do them seven days a week. If they have those requests, we need to continue to do that training to get that awareness to our community. I can't underscore how important that is for us. So Stephen, I wanted to turn to the kind of national strategy in the US. So. As someone coming from the UK, you know, it's taken me a long time, to be honest, to just grasp the, the scale and the size and, you know, the federal system versus the states. Now, obviously, coming from the Secret Service where you had field offices, you know, you, you had both a local approach, but also a national approach. How much of that is transferable for the Jewish community? You know, is it possible to create an American wide strategy or how much of this has to be hyper local? No, absolutely can be done nationally. Now, I, I, I know it's been said many times on this call regarding local, and, and I think we've talked about contacting the police, the FBI, and other like-minded organizations like SCAN or CSI. That's very important. But also the community groups in your local community should be included in that. But for the national level, I think it absolutely can be done and it should be done because um, it's been mentioned on this call earlier, it would affect something in Alabama, it could possibly affect something here in New York and across the country. So that is going to be a challenge to organize the, uh, the intelligence, the response, the, the collective effort that's needed on something like this. And certainly with DHS in government, it's a central location for coordination. And uh, I think we can do that. We can do that through CSS, CSI scan. I think, uh, as Mitch said, the partnership you know, since I first got involved with CSS a year ago, those partnerships have grown tremendously. And I think it's vital for them to partner successfully. And again, to make it a national effort, I think, Carly, that it's something that needs to be done. Carly, we have a national effort. We follow the FEMA model across the United States. We are looking to place uh, regional directors at each one of the uh, FEMA models across the United States. So that's exactly how we're looking at it at a national level to have coverage in every area across the country at this point. Thank you, Brad. So Mitch, if you had, you know, an elevator ride with, with a donor who's interested in, in the security field, you know, what do you think is, is first priority to help plug some of these gaps? 
Well, I think, you know, for, for New York, the two places that, that we're investing our effort is on this intelligence collection effort, having potentially, you know, more hands on keyboards, doing that uh, assessment, doing that searching for actionable intelligence. Um, so that's platforms and people. And then I think also on the physical security side, being able to do those assessments and get those applications done, developing some technology apps that will allow us to do it faster, more standardized with a product that gives us a better chance of winning federal funds. So it would be the two areas that I would focus on. And for people who aren't familiar with how to apply for those federal funds, um, where can they get more information? Um, well, both uh, New York CSI and SCN put out um, different uh, sort of uh, webinars as well as have resources. So come to our site, come to SCN's website, um, and we can give you resources to help you pursue that. And that's, you know, use, you can use that wherever you are in the U.S. Thank you. So Richard, from your point of view, um, CSS has grown dramatically in the last 18 months. You know, you could say that actually that's been necessitated by the threat increase over the last few years and perhaps the, the practical reality on the ground that the Jewish communities across America are starting to to understand the reality of needing to create um, volunteer security. Um, what do you see as a priority for CSS nationally over the next two years? I think one it's, it's expansion, uh, not only with our standalone teams, but also in raising that awareness right now. We have trained over 5,000 volunteers to help protect their communities. We are on, the, on a weekly basis protecting over 100, 125 synagogues. We do security for events, but there's many, many more institutions across the United States that, that could benefit from the, from the training that, that, that we offer. Um, and this is, you know, it's not that CSS is, is the only solution. Like we very much believe that we are one layer. We think on the national level, uh, what SCAN does is, is irreplaceable. We very much work in tandem with them and we try to coordinate the curriculum that we teach to, to make sure it aligns with sort of the, the, the training that they give institutions. But um, the sad reality is that there have been cases, and I'm just going to give an example from, from France, where um, uh, there were a number of schools in, 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 in a town that had security and one school did not have volunteer security. And, and that turned out to be the school that was the, the target of a very horrific terrorist attack a few years ago. So we believe that uh, it is not a solution unless everyone has a solution. So we believe that there is a, a huge gap to fill in terms of training people about uh, the ownership and the responsibility that they have for their community security, but also to help for us to help teams uh, across the country to, to be formed, to protect their, their synagogues, to protect their events. So right now, I think we're in around 12 regions, 12 states. Uh, obviously, there's many more states in the United States. So um, we, we hope to expand, we hope to train more people and help uh, volunteer security teams be uh, around as many of our institutions as possible. So we're coming up on the last couple of minutes and um, I'm going to end with um, giving each of you an opportunity, um, you know, to kind of have your last, your last two minutes. But, but Stephen, I, I thought perhaps I'd come to you first. You know, we've heard some, some scary things on this call, um, but I also think, you know, probably whilst the 6th of January, as you touched on, shouldn't have been a surprise to, to law enforcement, perhaps they treated it as, as a, another normal day. You know, from everything we've seen, that's, that's not the case anymore. Um, so from your assessment, you know, whilst the next couple of months are going to be difficult, um, what do you think about the law enforcement response that we can see? Well, I think everyone's leaning forward now. Uh, I think it's, everyone's super vigilant, um, super aware. I mean, uh, I think the law enforcement response uh, is appropriate for what we're, we're dealing with right now. The threat is real out there, and it's not just uh, demonstrations. The threat of violence is real. And so law enforcement, CSS, everyone, we all need to be leaning forward, super vigilant, super aware. And, uh, and I really have to applaud Richard and CSS. I mean, training is going to be a big factor going forward, but he's doing online training. I've attended at least, I think, once every other week, there's online training class that CSS is providing. And uh, I think that's a great benefit. So um, yeah, moving forward, I expect law enforcement to, uh, to be super aware because of what happened as the world's aware. 
Thank you, Brad. I'm going to come to you for your kind of last two minutes of, of closing. I, I won't even take two minutes, Carly. I think it's very important. We need to have awareness through education, through training, uh, everything we can do to train our community, what's in our power. We can't ignore those signs of hate. Come to us nationally if a community needs trained uh, in those basic situational awareness, countering active threat, stop the bleed, and the importance of reporting and why that matters to our community. We know, we know training helps save lives during a critical incident. We know reporting can proactively stop an event. So those two things alone build that holistic conscious culture of security in every one of our institutions. Thank you. And then Mitch, for the second time, I'm coming to you last, but in this case, I give you the final word, so. Sure, listen, I, I think you know, the Jewish community has to deal with the fact that we have a January 21 problem. Meaning that, you know, I think tomorrow hopefully will go off well, transition of power, but a lot of people who showed up on the mall and were intent on disrupting the transition of power um, are going to realize that they failed, whether it's at state capitals or in Washington, they, they failed. They're going to come home and they're going to stew and be angry that the person who they think won, you know, is not still the president. And unfortunately, they're going to be looking for scapegoats. And, you know, the scapegoats are going to be the elite. The scapegoats are going to be the globalists. And, you know, when we hear globalists, you know, we know the return address of that, that that shows up at our JCCs, at our schools, at our synagogues. So we've got this window while we're still somewhat under quarantine. The next three months or so going to the summer, we need to do as much as we can to harden our targets, to improve our intelligence collection, to improve our connections among our different groups uh, and our partnerships so that we are ready to face this uh, increasingly threatening situation out there. And we'll do it. We'll, we'll do it, we'll succeed, but it's gonna require extreme vigilance on our part, resources and effort. Thank you, Mitch. And, and you touched on, on where I wanted to close, which is that if Andres will have us all back, I, I suspect that the next panel in what we hope is a couple of months will be security and reopening uh, post COVID. So on that note, I'm gonna hand back to, uh, to Andres and just to say thank you all very much for joining me and uh, for letting me cut you off and, uh, and interfere a few times. I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, thank you to all the, to all the panelists and to Carly for this, for this great um, panel. I think it leaves us a lot of things to, to, to think about. I think that one of the next challenges we're gonna have that actually I just got a, uh, a question on, on via text, which is how to balance security with welcoming communities, especially for, for some populations that always feel, you know, that they look uh, with, with suspicion. So we can talk more about it when we meet again. But I, I just want to just close with a, with, a, with a thought, which is, you know, in a way it is unfortunate that we, as philanthropists, as funders, need to be thinking about these things. Uh, I would be rather you know talking about jewish identity and jewish education and and more joyful things but this is the time that that we're living and this is our responsibility and these things and these threats are happening on our watch so i think um as 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 funders as leaders in our communities we need to take this challenge uh, that we're facing very seriously and understand that um it's, it's from now on an integral part of communal life and something that we have to put very high up in our priority list. So thank you all very, very much and hope to continue this conversation uh, with all of you or with, uh, or with you uh, individually. Thank you all, good luck tomorrow and uh, let's hope for peace, quiet and health.